Today's hearing on uh, of the subcommittee of housing transportation and community development will come to order. The hearing will be in virtual format. This is my first hearing as chair of the subcommittee, and I'm so glad to be joined by ranking member rounds from South Dakota. Senator Rounds and I have worked together on um, native housing issues for several years. And when we started talking earlier this year about our shared interest in the subcommittee, native housing issues immediately came to mind as a topic for both of us. So I'm looking forward to working with Senator Rounds on this subcommittee, this Congress, as we examine a number of important housing, transportation, and community development issues. We're joined today by a panel of witnesses who will share their work to address housing insecurity in Native communities and their experiences with federal Indian housing programs. And this topic is personal to me. Minnesota is home to 11, 11 sovereign tribal nations and large indigenous populations in the Twin Cities, Duluth, and Bemidji. And I've had the great privilege of visiting and meeting with tribal leaders from Minnesota to hear firsthand what they see as challenges and opportunities in their communities. And in 2019, I held a statewide listening tour on housing issues. And as part of that tour, we held four tribal specific sessions. A constant, consistent message that I heard across all four listening sessions with Native leaders was the need for more supportive housing and culturally specific programming, particularly to support Native people experiencing homelessness. Current and historical trauma amongst Native Americans contributes to the disproportionately high prevalence of homelessness amongst these communities. And they told me that without culturally specific programming and trauma-informed care, this won't work. Native people experiencing homelessness struggle to access services, of course, and to maintain housing stability. It's a difficult challenge and tribal leaders are using scarce resources to try to address the complicated challenges of overcrowded homes, cost burden renters, and low home ownership rates on tribal lands. Consider that in Minnesota, 49% of native households own their own homes compared to 76% of white households. Nationally, this home ownership disparity exists as well, with about 51% of Native households owning a home compared to about 73% of white households. Home ownership requires access to credit, but in 2019, leaders, lenders in Minnesota denied almost 25% of Native American mortgage applications. By contrast, lenders denied only 6% of white applicants. Inequities in mortgage lending are only one factor contributing to disparities in home ownership. We also know that legal barriers to lending on trust land, a lack of intergenerational wealth, and underinvestment in federal Indian housing programs is also an issue. In this hearing, we have a platform to elevate the voices of those struggling with housing insecurity and those working to combat it in communities from Fond du Lac, Minnesota, to the Pine Ridge Reservations in South Dakota, to Montana, Nevada, and all over the country. The last time the Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee held a, de a, a hearing dedicated to these issues was during the 112th Congress, when fewer than half of the members of the subcommittee were even members of the Senate. I'm hopeful that today presents an opportunity for this committee to rededicate ourselves to meeting the treaty and moral obligations of our nation when it comes to ensuring that Native Americans have access to safe, affordable, and stable housing. We have a once in a generation moment to address the deep systemic barriers in housing to housing in Indian country. And I hope that you all will join me in this effort. Together, we can help Native families across the country secure safe, stable, and affordable housing. And we can finally give tribes the resources that they need, resources that are already they are already owed, so that we can find solutions that work in community. It is on us to prove to tribal nations that the federal government is ready to live up to its commitments and to play a role in reducing homelessness, providing housing assistance, and reducing disparities in home ownership. Before I turn to Senator Rounds, I'd just like to say a brief word about how I view the work of this subcommittee. Housing and transportation issues we know touch the lives of every single American. If you don't have a safe, affordable place to live, nothing else in your life works. It's nearly impossible to focus on your education, your job, or your family if you don't have a good, stable place to live. 
And if you can't get where you need to go safely, affordably, and reliably, it's pretty hard for anything else in your life to work either. Right now, too many families are struggling to, to find affordable housing and to get access to transportation, especially families of color and Native people. This has happened for a range of reasons, the history of unfair and inequitable federal housing policies, lack of funding, and a lack of understanding, sometimes just a lack of attention. So I intend to use this subcommittee to examine these issues and to do all that we can to make sure that housing and transit policies work for all families. I can't wait to roll up my sleeves and to get to work, and I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today and from the members of this subcommittee. And now I'll turn to Senator Rounds for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for taking the time to attend today's hearing. I look forward to hearing from all of you. Let me just begin, though, by uh, thanking uh, the chair. Um, Senator Smith and I are not only working on housing issues, we're working on a number of the rural areas. And sometimes that's not something that we talk about and with regard to, to items that make news in the you know, in, in the headlines or anything, but there's a lot of us that try to work across the lines back and forth. And in the Senate, it requires bipartisan support for any type of activity to move forward. And Senator Smith and I are working on ag issues. We're working on water development issues, rural economic issues. And this is an area that, as the, the chairwoman has said, this is an area that we both agree is a place where we really can make a difference in our home states and for rural parts of our country. Uh, today, this committee will examine an issue of great importance to me and to so many in my home state of South Dakota, and one that this committee has not held a hearing on in nearly 10 years. That issue is providing safe, affordable, and stable housing for Native American communities throughout the United States. I hope this is one of multiple opportunities that we'll have to address this matter, this Congress, and work together across the aisle on solutions to the policy challenges in this area. This issue not only impacts the lives of thousands of South Dakotans, but also millions more of our tribal members across the United States. In South Dakota, we have nine federally recognized tribes, each of which faces various and unique tribal housing concerns. One of these tribes is represented here today, and I'd like to introduce Mr. Eric Shepard from the Sister and Wapner Oyatai in South Dakota. Eric, thank you for being with us today. Uh, you might want to just wave at everybody, Eric. Um, recent data shows that housing conditions for Native American households are substantially worse than U.S. households. In fact, Native Americans have some of the greatest housing needs in the United States. And that's according to the National Low Income Housing Coalition. The reasons for this being they face overcrowding, high poverty rates, lack of plumbing, inadequate heating, and other severe infrastructure issues. And that is if they're even able to access housing options at all. This is a serious problem and now is the time to fix it. In addition, there are other fundamental challenges that make home ownership more difficult for Native Americans. The complicated legal nature of tribal trust land can make it exponentially more difficult uh, to lend and borrow on land in Indian country. Now, legislation that Senator Smith and I partnered on in the past has resolved a number of complications, but there is clearly more work to do. The FDIC also reports that Native American and Alaska Native American individuals are unbanked at triple the average of other Americans. Not having access to financial services makes owning and even renting a home all that much more difficult. I hope today's hearing will also shed light into how housing challenges are exacerbated by other legal and economic issues. Even before COVID-19 pandemic, Native American housing programs already in existence have failed to adequately serve the needs of our poorest tribal communities, especially in more rural areas across the country. It is my hope that Congress can also make progress this year on reauthorization of the Native American Housing Assistance and Self-Determination Act, or NAHASDA, and I look forward to hearing our witnesses' thoughts on reauthorizations, reforms, and alternative funding options for Native housing in light of the recent pandemic. These past few months, the COVID-19 pandemic has pushed more Native Americans living on reservations to seek home ownership, but longstanding barriers continue to prevent this. That is why I partnered together once again with Senator Smith 
on two pieces of legislation, including the Native American Housing Affordability Act and legislation reforming the Native American Direct Lending Program, both of which I'm looking forward to discussing today. For years, Congress and tribal leaders have worked to address these Native American housing issues. There have been a range of different approaches and challenges, and we seem to have fallen short along the way. While these issues are complex and compounded when put into rural settings, there is no excuse for the situation which so many of our tribal members face every single day just by being or wanting to be at home. It's time that we make a concerted effort of stakeholders and in consultation with our tribal members to develop solutions that meet the needs of our state's growing tribal communities. Again, we welcome all of you here today and look forward to hearing your testimony about this very important issue. And I thank you for attending and participating. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Senator Rounds. I am now going to introduce our witnesses. I will introduce all five witnesses and then turn to each of you to make your opening um, statements. We have with us today Dante Desiderio, the Chief Executive Officer of the National Congress of American Indians, Adrian Stevens, the Acting Board Chair of the National American Indian Housing Council, and also the Executive Director of the Seneca National Housing Authority and a member of the Seneca Nation. Aline Churamoff, the, Sen the Senior Vice President for Community Development and the Center for Indian Country Development at the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank. Michael Gozi, the Chief Executive Officer of the American Indian Community Development Corporation in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and also the Chair of the Board of the Commissioners, excuse me, the Chair of the Board of Commissioners of the Ho-Chunk Housing and Community Development Agency, and a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation. Greetings to my fellow Minnesotans. And also, Eric Shepard, the Executive Director of the Sisseton Wapiton Housing Authority in Sisseton, South Dakota. Um, Eric is also a member to, a member of the Sisseton Wapiton Oyate community. Welcome and thank all of you for your willingness to speak with us today, and I look forward to hearing from each of you. Before you begin your opening statements, just a few reminders. Once you start speaking, there will be a slight delay before you are displayed on the screen. To minimize background noise, please click the mute button until it's your turn to speak or ask questions. You should have all on your screens a box labeled clock that will show you how much time you have remaining. And for witnesses, I ask you to please um, keep your opening statements to about five minutes. Um, you will have the opportunity to have your full written statement submitted as part of the record. Uh, for all senators, the five minute clock applies to your questions also. When you have 30 seconds remaining for your statements or questions, you will hear a bell ring to remind you that your time has almost expired and it will ring again when your time has expired. And if there is a technology issue, we'll just move to the next uh, witness or senator until that technology issue is resolved. And to simplify the speaking order, Senator Rounds and I have agreed to go by seniority in this hearing. And I will now turn to Mr. Desiderio for your opening statements. Thank you, Senator, and good morning, uh, Chairwoman Smith and Ranking Member Rounds and members of the Subcommittee on Housing, Transportation, and Community Development. Uh, this is quite an honor to be present in the uh, Senate Banking Committee. Uh, on behalf of the National Congress of American Indians, um, I'm, uh, the, as the Chief Executive Officer, I'm uh, Dante Desiderio, a member of the Saponi Tribe. And uh, we represent uh, the largest and oldest organization comprised of sovereign tribal nations and their citizens. So tribal nations across the country aim to maintain housing infrastructure that improves their citizens' health outcomes, sustains their regional economy, and importantly addresses the growing population uh, with our tribes. And I do wanna just comment for a second um, on the idea, uh, Chairwoman Smith, of taking a listening tour in Indian country. It's the best way to learn about Indian country and Senator Rounds, I agree that now is the time to fix it. So for decades, the federal government has recognized the trust responsibility to tribal nations to provide adequate housing that's been chronically underfunded. And as a result, our tribal communities see overcrowded homes, at, right, at a rate roughly eight times the national average and over 70% of our existing housing requires extensive upgrades and repairs. 
In 2017, HUD reported that it will take approximately 68,000 new units to alleviate overcrowding and replace those in grave condition. These disparities increase the vulnerability of American Indians and Alaskan Natives to the COVID-19 pandemic and re resulted in our community having at times the highest infection, hospitalization, and death rates per capita in the United States. Today, my testimony will focus on impediments and barriers facing tribal nations and tribally designated housing entities when attempting to build and finance housing. Then I'll turn to recommendations that will allow for construction and financing of housing on tribal lands. Uh, first, I want to address the challenges and barriers of lending on trust lands and the burdensome permitting process. In 2019, the FDIC found that 16% of tribal households were unbanked, compared to only 5% of the general population. The unique status of trust lands and the lack of education of most, most private lenders makes them reluctant to lend uh, to either individual natives, tribal nations, and tribally designated housing entities. Further exacerbating this issue, the BIA must review all trust land leases and provide verification of ownership, which can be delayed for months. Second, um, there's a lack of access to housing tax credits um, for uh, multifamily housing units uh, in Indian country. Uh, these tax credits are only provided to state governments who in turn uh, have the uh, ability to offer those to tribal nations, but often do not, or if they do, it's uh, sporadic. And third, while construction costs and inflation continue to rise, flat federal funding on Indian housing program results in a sharp decrease in the amount of affordable housing units. And finally, while identifying barriers is helpful in understanding challenges, uh, it doesn't always offer a pathway forward for creating policy solutions. So I want to offer a few solutions. Uh, one, Congress should increase the access to the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program and provide tax credits at a proportionate rate uh, for tribal governments. Second, Congress support, should support finalizing the implementation of the most recent CRA proposed rules and encourage other uh, over banking oversight entities to adopt similar rules. Third, Congress should create a $50 million tribal uh, allocation from the USDA 502 direct lending program to get capital into Indian country and uh, expand the test program that was done in South Dakota. And lastly, while outside the jurisdiction of this committee, Congress should reauthorize the NAHASDA and uh, fully fund NAHASDA. Uh, NAHASDA would authorize two important home loan programs, the Title VI Loan Guarantee Program and the Section 184 Loan Guarantee Program. And when drafting this legislation, National Congress of American Indians urges Congress to establish an Assistant Secretary for Indian Housing at the Housing and Urban uh, Development that would streamline environmental rules, uh, allow tribal housing programs to access IHS sanitation funding, and Congress should also permanently authorize tribal uh, HUD uh, veterans assistant program to ensure all Native veterans receive the benefits they deserve. And just in conclusion, uh, if Congress does not act, existing uh, tribal housing will continue to deteriorate and tribes will be left vulnerable if they, as they have been in this, uh, as we've all seen during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Thank you so much for allowing me to testify. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And um, we will now turn to Mr. Stevens. Good morning. Uh, my name is Adrian Stevens and I'm the acting, direct, acting chair of the board of directors of the National American Indian Housing Council. I'm a member of the Seneca Nation in New York, and I currently serve as Executive Director of the Seneca Nation Housing Authority. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before the Senate Banking Subcommittee today to discuss tribal housing. I would like to thank Chairwoman Smith, Ranking Member Rounds, and committee members for having this hearing. In addition to the comments I will be make today, I have submitted a formal written statement for the record. The committee asked us to describe the state of housing in the country. Unfortunately, the answer is that Unmet housing needs in our tribal community are great and they are persistent. There is a long-standing housing shortage across Indian country due to years of stagnant investment. 
Tribal housing programs rely on federal funding through the HASDA, which established the Indian Housing Block Grant for tribes 25 years ago. Funding for the HASDA programs has been flat for nearly 20 years, providing tribes only two-thirds of the purchasing power today that the HASDA funds provided in the 1990s. And we are asking tribes to do a lot with their housing dollars each year. Tribes are tasked with managing existing housing stock that have been developed over decades and now it's often aging and needing constant repairs. We ask tribes to also provide low-income rental assistance, provide student housing, housing and supportive services for elders and veterans, housing counseling services for future homeowners, and we expect them to build new housing units each year. Tribes are expected to carry out all these services when nearly 400 of the Indian Housing Block Grant recipients receive less than 500,000 a year to do so, and 175 tribal communities receive less than 100,000 a year for their housing programs. To be clear, NAHASDA has been successful. It has provided tribes dedicated and consistent funding each year, enabling tribal housing programs to improve their capacity and ability to improve their communities. Tribal housing programs have never been capable to provide housing, housing services to the communities and that is due to the HAZDA. When we fall short is the lack of investments to spur new housing development in Indian country. In the first decade of the HAZDA, tribes were building well over 2,000 units a year across the country. More than had been built annually before the HAZDA was enacted. New construction has significantly decreased, however, as funding diminishes with inflation each year. Currently, tribes are building or purchasing roughly 1,000 units a year, while a 2017 HUD report found that 68,000 units are, are needed to address overcrowded homes and sub substandard housing in tribal communities. Unless we change how we invest in housing development in Indian country, tribes will not catch up. Prior to Nahaza, tribes were piecing their housing programs together with various grants and funding sources. Despite the original promise of the block grant, tribes are again today piecing their housing programs together. Tribes are levering resources and programs from the U.S. Treasury, USDA, Veterans Fair, non-tribal HUD programs, and others. However, as tribes put these pieces together, they are often congruent with a multitude of different eligibility requirements environmental reviews and program rules. As project planning becomes more complex due to leverage, leveraging multiple funding sources, tribes must weigh each project's impact and deter, determine the best use of their staff's time and bandwidth. So what can we do and what can Congress do? First and foremost, we need to reauthorize and properly fund the HASDA programs. The HASDA provides the greatest flexibility for tribes to meet unique housing needs of their communities and when properly funded, we see new unit development across Indian country. We have to encourage commercial lending and investment through direct tax credits and incentives. Too often, private banks and lenders avoid tribal communities because the perception is that projects are too complex or they don't provide the same efficient return on investment that a similar project in a non-tribal area would provide. We have to improve administrators of trust land and how Delays in simple trust land documentation deter banks and government lenders alike from prioritizing housing loans on trust lands. We have to demand that all federal housing programs include tribal communities in both eligibility and implementation. Low income housing tax credit, USDA rural housing, housing trust fund, and other programs all seem like ideal fits to solve tribal housing issues, yet those resources impact tribal communities sparingly across the country, if at all. We have seen promise in federal and state programs that prioritize or incentivize tribal areas or create specific set-asides. And we see promise when a federal program that is nationally in scope, like the USA Single Family Home Loan Program, partners directly with tribal organizations to market and implement their federal programs directly in tribal communities. In that USDA pilot program in South Dakota, we have seen CDF, native CDFIs issue more USDA, USDA back home loans in true tribal communities in the, in the single year than USDA was able to provide in the past decade. So let's do more of that. In short, we have to increase investments of dollars and effort from Congress, from federal agencies, from tribes, from the private sector. We must recognize the real nature of many communities. 
The small size of many tribal communities, the higher cost of project development in tribal communities, all factor together to diminish the economies of scale that drive housing development. And we have to invest anyway because it, it's, it is needed in our tribal communities where our families continue to face greater, greater levels of overcrowded and subset of their homes and lack of affordable housing options. With that, I will end my statement and look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you again for your support in improving the housing opportunities for Native American, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiians across the United States. Thank you very much. I'll turn now to Aline Chirma. Thank you, Chair Smith, Ranking Member Rounds, and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. As the Senior Vice President of Community Development and Engagement at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, I oversee the work of the Center for Indian Country Development. The CICD supports tribes through actionable research and community collaboration to further tribal economic prosperity and also leverages our department's broader expertise on affordable housing, labor markets, and early childhood development. I should add today that my views that I express here are not necessarily the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis or the Federal Reserve System. Our work on housing involves applied research, community engagement, and constant attention to the economic literature in the field. Our work points to the harmful effects of the current state of housing for Native Americans, Alaska Natives, and other indigenous populations. My comments and detailed written testimony focus on Indian country specific housing challenges and opportunities demonstrated by Indian country's leaders. As you've already heard this morning, housing is often in short supply and it's substandard conditions in Indian country. Homes are seven times more likely to be crowded and nearly four times more likely to lack complete plumbing. These conditions have been shown to harm, fa harm family health and stability. In 2017, HUD estimated that 68,000 units would be needed just to address these issues, which would likely cost tens of billions of dollars. We focus on five factors that reinforce these barriers. First, Native nations are sovereign, but their land is held in trust and must have its title cleared by the U.S. government. Mortgages on trust land are also leasehold mortgages as opposed to fee simple mortgages, and house housing professionals and homebuyers frequently identify these hurdles as significant. Second, Indian country home buyers often face an uphill battle working with lenders to finance their home. Our economist's work shows that Native American borrowers on tribal lands are more likely to receive high cost loans, leaving them ultimately to pay more for their homes over the life of their mortgage. Third, the tools designed to work in Indian country are often underutilized on trust land. So this applies to Indian country specific products like HUD's Section 184 program, but it's also true of products whose features make them relevant in Indian country like the USDA's Section 502 program. The fourth reason relates to the federal government's failure to fulfill treaty obligations. Developments in Indian country often pay today for the resulting historical underinvestment in physical infrastructure. So for example, poor access to water or transportation raises the overall cost of construction. Fifth, federal fund funding sources with different eligibility requirements and process requirements complicate the pre-construction process in and may not reflect the unique needs of Indian country. No quick fixes will radically improve things overnight, but there are plenty of innovations that show promise for a brighter future and present potential avenues for involvement for Congress. Our research and engagement suggest four recommendations. First, the federal government should continue to expand financial capacity um, of Native community, financial de finan community Development Financial Institutions, CDFIs, and other tribal institutions. Native CDFIs offer community grounded credit solutions in Indian country, and our research suggests that the presence and activities of Native CDFIs increases the credit score of Indian country residents that previously had the lowest credit scores. And the pilot that was just mentioned involving two Native CDFIs and the USDA in South Dakota has shown the power of connecting community based lenders and federal lending resources. Second, the federal government can, can create normalized and complementary interagency lending processes in Indian country. So we recommend that federal agencies and government sponsored enterprises work with representatives from tribal governments, lenders, developers, and nonprofits to find solutions and provide guidance for housing in Indian country. Third, an improved title process on trust land would support housing development and tribal sovereignty. The helping expedite and advance res responsible tribal home ownership, also known as the Hearth Act of 2012, created a process for tribes to assume additional control of trust land management. But sufficient funding is not available through the Hearth Act itself to fund the administrative capacity, 
necessary for taking over trust land management from the BIA, and that cost is simply too high for many tribes. Finally, data on Native Americans and Indian country programs should be improved. With some exceptions, existing resources, ex existing sources are often insufficient to assess policy impacts or changes in the population level well-being. So illuminating economic conditions in Indian country will require collaboration on methodologies and new financial resources to obtain su sufficient statistical samples. Congress has recently taken steps to support tribal sovereignty and access to important housing resources. And I hope our testimony today provides insight into how federal policy can further support and accelerate Indian country's upward momentum. I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity to share insights from CICD's work. Thank you very much. I'll turn now to Mr. Gozi. Um, good morning, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Rounds, and the members of the subcommittee. It's my honor to provide testimony to this committee this morning and looking at the current situation regarding safe, standard, and affordable housing on tribal trust land or within rural or urban settings throughout our country, American Indians fall far short of the national average in the percentage of home ownership when compared to their white counterparts. There are several reasons for this disparity. First, access to mortgage products that meet the specific needs of, American, of the American Indian population. The Section 184 home, Indian Home Loan Guarantee Program is a home mortgage product specifically designed for American Indian, Alaskan Native families, Alaskan villages, tribes, and tribally designated housing entities. Congress established this program in 1992 to facilitate and increase access to capital in American Indian communities. Although this mortgage pro pro product has had some impact, it has not equaled the playing field. The number of lending institutions that offer the Section 184 loan product are limited to a select few. I would suggest that the Section 184 or a like loan product would be better served and provided through American Indian Community Development Financial Institutions, CDFIs, that are a great asset to the Indian country, both on reservations and in urban areas. The, the CDFIs provide a myriad of services, all dedicated to the financial success of its clients. The work of the CDFI in home ownership is providing home buyer education, home buyer counseling, credit repair, budgeting, responsibilities of home ownership, and other aspects of this sometimes daunting process. A large number of American Indian clients seeking home ownership are first time homeowners looking to provide stability, enhancing the community stabilization, making these services important to their individual success. I believe this relationship would benefit through the mortgage process. Currently their, pro their clients make applications for mortgages with other lending institutions. Sometimes these are online application, and this can be a totally different experience than they've had in the past in working with CDFI. To provide an opportunity for American Indian CDFIs to have a mortgage product like the Section 184 will complete the process and provide a greater level of success. American Indian CDI, CDFIs, given the opportunity, could provide a better level of service, gain the knowledge and financial benefits of the mortgage process, making this a win-win for both the clients and the CDFI. Secondly, affordability. Income levels within uh, Native American communities have a substantial effect on the home loan amount available to them. In today's housing prices, the availability of homes are scarce in lower price areas. We ha having a forgivable def uh, deferred loan product will make will, will reduce over time will be a great investment to the stabilization of American Indian families and communities. Having a safe, standard, and affordable home creates the foundation that promotes better outcomes in areas of education, health, and financial stability. Our homes can be the single greatest financial asset in one's life, making way for families to continue to thrive versus just survive in the current economic climate. By investing in our American Indian families via home ownership, we can create an immediate impact to the lives of our youth, elders, and adults. This type of investment creates immediate impact and also provides long-term impact in the stabilization of families. Thirdly, 
uh, a land trust model. We have used the land trust model in Minneapolis to make home ownership more affordable. You know, in Minneapolis, we have much success in this and reducing the mortgage loan amount by having land owned through a land trust. This provides the ability to create the buying power of the homeowner and by having the land held outside of the mortgage. It provides a monthly benefit to the homeowner in a reduced monthly payment. In the land trust model, the appreciation is shared by a predetermined amount so that should the property be sold. The land trust model can also be beneficial in continued housing affordability for the community by reinvest, reinvestment of the appreciation by the land trust. Lastly, in today's times, we need to use every financial opportunity to help American Indian families understand and relish in the benefits of home ownership. We need to use a number of initiatives to make home ownership possible. At AICDC, we have used city, county, and state funding options, including grants, deferred loans, and other home ownership initiatives. And this has made, we look forward to our federal partners in providing opportunities to increase home ownership to American Indian families throughout the country. I thank you for your attention to this matter. Thank you very much. And we'll now turn to Mr. Shepard. I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Ch uh, Madam Smith for the opportunity to speak, Vice Chairman Toomey, Senator Rounds, and other members of the subcommittee for this opportunity to talk about Indian, Indian housing today. It has been an especially hard and challenging 15 months for those of us on the Persistent Wapton Reservation in South Dakota. We were hit hard early with the COVID pandemic at home, and we are still working on recovery today. Housing has been at the forefront of the recovery efforts, providing a safe place for our members to shelter and recover and managing the many new relief programs that in Congress have provided to us. A large part of our recovery effort at System Wapton involves looking past the pandemic and into the long-term status of Indian housing programs. Both on our reservation and in the United States as a whole, the perennially inadequate funding and other program issues that existed prior to 2020 must now be addressed to assure the long-term sustainability of Indian housing <clears throat> for the first Americans. To put it more plainly, we all must understand something is wrong. When the base level appropriation for the Native American Indian Housing and Self-Determination Act, NAHASDA, has not been increased since the law was originally passed 25 years ago, as Congress and the new Biden administration focuses on helping American rebuild its dilapidated infrastructure and recalibrate its housing assistance programs, Indian country and Indian housing must also be given fair consideration. I know the subcommittee has a particular interest in the HUD Section 184 program. Operating in Indian country, I can tell you that the 184 program has had limited impact on reservation lands held in trust by the United States. While a few individuals have been able to secure lease, leasehold mortgages under the program, most of the funds go to off reservation lands in urban areas where banks and lenders are more comfortable with providing traditional mortgages. The situation has not helped with HUD recent revision of the or the program regulations that send the, the program back in time before the, 19, the 84, 184 Act was passed in 1992, requiring underwriting provisions and fees that are not affordable or helpful to developing new housing on reservation lands. I'd like to call the subcommittee's attention to a number of important issues that Congress should address regarding Indian housing programs. We appreciate the emergency funds received to date and needed to receive a fair share of the new housing infrastructure funds as well. The CARES Act, the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, and the American Rescue Plan have all included much needed emergency funds to support Indian housing operations during the pandemic. We do appreciate that Congress has allocated money to alleviate the short-term effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. We can confirm that this money had an immediate and vital impact on preserving and protecting housing services and resources in our tribal communities. Our proposal to, to now address the more long-term and sustainable solutions to improving Indian housing, the recently proposed American Jobs Plan includes 
$231 billion to improve and produce more housing and housing infrastructure, including a proposed amount of at least $50 billion to renovate, rehabilitate federally assisted housing. We are asking you to help ensure that if new infrastructure legislation is passed, Indian housing continue to get its fair share of the funding. A 5% set aside for Indian housing would be a $2.5 billion. As you are aware, federal programs have long negotiated Indian countries need to maintain and improve its aging housing stock. Housing needs in tribal areas remain the most severe in the nation and resources to address the problem have declined more rapidly than for other federal housing programs. <clears throat> Ten of thousands of new units are needed. Thousands of existing units, some which are currently boarded up because of lack of funding and severe methamphetamine contamination are also in need of substantial rehabilitation. The simple fact is that $2,500,000,000 of additional new funding is needed. If these conditions are going to be effectively addressed, tribes and their PDHEs have the capacity to build and rehabilitate their housing. Most observers know and most studies show, including the recent housing needs of American Indians and Alaskan Natives in tribal areas, a report from the assessment of American Indian and Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian needs, housing needs. By HUD, PD, and R, and the Urban Institute, January 2017, the report that TDHEs have, or if needed, can quickly reacquire the capacity to build housing and other related infrastructure construction on this scale. TDHEs are prepared to quickly gear up to produce a substantial number of new units. This will help tribes and Alaskan villages generate for their communities, the county, the country, post-pandemic re economic recovery, just as they did successfully 10 years ago after the Great Recession and the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act that are of tribes. Thank you for this time to testify. To testify. Thank you very much to all of our panelists, and we'll now begin a round of uh, five minute uh, questions um, from senators and I will start um, actually right. I think where Mr. Shepard um, was leaving off, which is the the unique challenge that we have on uh, with housing on tribal lands, which is that properties are far more likely to have really significant, severe physical uh, defects than the rest of the United States housing stock all in. In fact, on tribal lands, plumbing is deficient at a rate five times higher than the national average, and homes on tribal lands lack heating at a rate of more than 100 times the national average. So let me maybe turn to Mr. Desiderio and Mr. Stevens, and you could just talk about why you think these physical challenges are so much pervasive on um, in tribal housing, and then let us know, is, is this primarily a funding issue, or are there other things that we need to be doing in order to address this deep challenge? Well, I, 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 I want to address the, I go back in time a little bit to address this. There's this idea that, um, you know, tribes are on, uh, have been placed on marginal lands. They have a limited land base and the housing uh, stock is not kept up with the demand. So when you're looking at uh, building on limited land base in, in, with limited access to water and other infrastructure, uh, the issues that you're mentioning tend to um, be more significant. The, it is an issue of funding, and I'm glad we're having this conversation uh, around housing um, during a national conversation of what is infrastructure. And this isn't an isolated issue. So as we're talking about infrastructure, we really need to talk about the infrastructure needs that support housing, uh, which is what you're 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 getting at at your question. Um, the if the housing stock uh, isn't keeping up with the demand, and we have higher the highest um, you know um, number of uh, family members per household, um, it, it it stresses the existing housing stock, and then the limitations on funding of uh, you know, the water infrastructure, which has gone down and also looking at uh, our lands are not included in the Water Resources Conservation Act, which provides USDA with um, uh, that, that type of planning authority. Uh, so there's a number of issues that go into this, but mostly on the marginal lands and the lack of ability to address the larger and really expensive infrastructure issues that go into forming a really um, a holistic community or holistic housing stock. 
Yeah, thank you. So we should be thinking about this clearly in the context of this larger infrastructure conversation we're having. Mr. Stevens, would you like to add anything to uh, to that? Uh, I think Dante hit it right on a right on a knot. They're really uh, talking about the infrastructure issues and lack of funding. You know, rather than repeat what he said, he's pretty much stated what what what, what uh, answering your question. But again, you know, the older the homes that we have on reservation are are, are really uh, one of the issues that. We have, and you know, and finally um, being able to replace all the homes that we do have. And I think Thank just you. having that availability of funding available. So right, right. So um, let me turn to Mr. Gozi, um, Mike. In the recovery from the coronavirus crisis, the community development CDFIs have played a really important role in providing finances, financing to folks that have been overlooked by or un, you know, un, unable to get access to financing. Could you just talk to us about how, what we need to do to help CDFIs support home ownership for indigenous uh, people and you know, what you've seen is most effective in accomplishing this goal from the perspective of CDFIs? Well, uh, AICD created a, a community level loan fund that actually is morphed into a uh, Minnesota fund, which is the CDFI. It's a new CDFI. They chose not to enter into the PPP uh, arena because of their, their size. Um, but I see the CDFIs as being the most integral part of home ownership, especially in the urban areas and on the reservation areas, you know, serving both uh, in the urban area and, and working with the Ho-Chunk Community Development Agency um, in Wisconsin. I, I see the advantage of the CDFIs both in the urban and on the reservation in rural areas. And so I believe by supporting them with providing more products that they can use uh, to reach their uh, clients and, and tribal members would be advantageous, both in home ownership and actually all lending opportunities, which we see the Native American being unbanked and, and not, not uh, being able to access some of the financial needs that they might have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Stevens, I'm very interested in the USDA 502 loan pilot program in South Dakota. I expect that Senator Rounds will act, ask about that, but if he doesn't, um, I'll return to that. Uh, Senator Rounds. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I, I most certainly appreciate the fact that we're having this hearing today, and there seems to be a whole series of uh, topics here that our, our, our panelists have already delved into, but let me just begin with this, and, and I'd like to direct this first one to, to Mr. Shepard. Although it doesn't fall squarely within the jurisdiction of the Banking Committee, I hope that Congress can make progress this year on the reauthorization of the Native American Housing Assistance and Self-Determination Act, or NAHASDA. Um, NAHASDA is a very broad piece of legislation, but I was hoping to learn more about some of the priorities your organizations and tribes have identified for a reauthorization package. And Ms. Trippin, I know you have an interest in this, and that's the reason why I'm directed to you first. What are some of the key priorities that the Sisseton and Wapiton Oyate is hoping to see when the HASDA is reauthorized? Thank you, uh, Senator Rounds. <clears throat> um, in, in several other contexts, when tribes need approval from an agency, Congress has authorized the deemed approved approach to move a decision point past the agency. And if the agency takes too long to act, would you support this kind of approach in the context of HUD decision making under the NAHASDA? NAHASDA expired in 2013 and has not been reauthorized since, despite efforts in every session to do so. What obstacles of development, affordable housing, and lack are there improvements to the low, low income housing areas? Um, I think it's time, you know, I think we need to change our mission there. You know, we've been going 25 years now, Senator. Yeah. You know, we've had multiple consultations with tribes coming to DC and, and maybe it's, it's more than once a year. You know we're, we're we're getting past the pandemic now, and maybe uh, it's it's time that uh, it, it is time. I, I, let's leave it at that. It's it is time to reauthorize Nahasda. 
Thank you. And I, I, you know, I was thinking about this also, and I'm going to direct my next, my next question to Mr. Uh, Desert Rio. Uh, an article from the Billings Gazette recently referred to federal assistance for Indian country as the Marshall Plan for Indian country. It pointed out that the American Rescue Plan dedicated $36 billion to federally recognized tribes this year on top of $8 billion from CARES. Given the scope of challenges when it comes to housing, I really hope that this money is being directed and that you're seeing it on the ground there. Can you tell us more about the effectiveness of how those funds are being transmitted through the bureaucracy and whether or not there it seems to be any effectiveness with regard to the federal assistance during the COVID-19 when it comes to housing specifically? Right. Uh, thank you for that, Senator. So we the the experience for tribes on the discretionary funds uh, from the CARES Act uh, should be separated a little bit from the American Rescue Plan. The CARES Act through the Department of Treasury had limitations on the use of the funds, so infrastructure was relatively limited uh, for tribes to be able to pursue. The subsequent legislation opened up housing, uh, had housing vouchers, uh, and then in this latest round of the American Rescue Plan, Infrastructure was included, but it wasn't housing. So we are able to address some of the water issues and the sanitation issues with the Rescue Act funding and get to some of the housing vouchers and housing assistance uh, through some of the other uh, legislation. So it's all in incredibly helpful. Uh, and I think it serves as a model uh, for putting out discretionary money. Uh, but the other side of that is opening the options for tribes to be able to address the dramatic infrastructure needs that have come out during this pandemic and really uh, uh, showcased uh, what deficiency in infrastructure, what are, what are those real impacts? And, and uh, so the Marshall Plan idea is great and the discretionary funding is great. Um, and we are looking forward to addressing some of the infrastructure needs uh, but we're also looking forward to um, further support through uh, infrastructure funding to be able to uh, open that discretionary funding up or the programmatic funding up to address all of these needs. I think that uh, tying hands on discretionary money uh, may not be the best uh, use for addressing our needs on the ground that we all know firsthand in our communities. Thank you. Uh, let me just follow up, and I, I, I do want to follow up on Senator Smith's comments uh, concerning the 502 direct lending program, and I know that we've got a pilot project working. I know there's more that we could do to help these programs function appropriately. And to Mr. Stevens, uh, do you have any thoughts on how to improve and to build on the 502 program? Have we learned anything so far? Um. I really haven't had any uh, issues or really any type of uh, development with the 502 program here at Seneca. Um, and again, you know, looking at that, I think really the openness of the regulations that you need to follow to get to go through that program are, are limited to what we try to do here on tribal lands, you know. It's tough, you know. They open that up, but it's very little, very little usage of that funding available there is is limited. So, I think we can uh, open it up and look at uh, more consultation on how to utilize those funds a lot easier for tribes to be able to provide the housing needs of uh, of our communities. So. Okay, well, well, thank you. And my time has expired, but perhaps we can explore that a little bit more later on here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you to this panel. This is a great discussion. I'm very proud I get to represent uh, 27 uh, tribal communities uh, in the state of Nevada. Let me start with the federal home loan bank uh, investments. Um, uh, there are 11 government sponsored enterprises uh, that we know as the federal home loan banks, and they're required to meet the affordable housing and community development needs of the communities uh, of the states that they serve. So, my question to the panel members 
Um, how many tribes, to your knowledge, uh, have received investments from the federal home loan bank programs like the community investment program or the community investment cash advance or the affordable housing program? Uh, I, I'm curious to know if the data here uh, and maybe is it Mr. Is it Desiderio? If we could start right. with you. Are you familiar with, with any of this money from federal home loan banks going to any of the tribal communities for housing? Yeah, thank you for asking that. And just to point out, the federal home loan uh, bank has reached out to get native representation uh, from Senator Smith's home state, uh, Chief Benjamin, from the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. It's going to be serving on that board. And they've had limited outreach as well to um, a CDFI technical um, organization. But in, in general, I, I don't know if I can answer the question on how many, but it really has been very limited outreach. If you look at the federal, the potential of the federal home loan bank, they have two different areas. One is on being able to reassure, um, provide liquidity to banks. There's a lot of Native American banks that could benefit from that. But on the other side of it, if you look at their plans and their limited plans, they're not addressing the real needs of Indian country. Uh, just meeting with a CDFI technical advisor is not enough, and it doesn't go to the understanding of tribal issues and the capital needs that tribes are faced with. Senator Rounds um, bringing up the 502 program is a great example of the creativity of a program to be able to adjust to a member's income and lower the interest rate. It's also the ability to get direct funding for relending into communities. So all these things are possible and they should serve as a model for the capital markets and not as a substitute. And I think that's really important. So the federal home loan bank in providing some of the, the priorities for the bank, their plans for the bank, um, you know, in, in, in being able to address Indian country needs, it has not acted in that direction. And the other thing uh, that they can do is they have a lot of grants that could go out to tribal communities, but they're going out to serve housing needs in the same way uh, and not really using the tribal governments and their role in, in uh, providing housing to their citizens. So uh, 700 or $800 million in grant funding is not finding its way to reassure the capital markets or bring housing into native communities. Thank you. And is it fair to say the only reason that they recently reached out is because Senator Smith has been engaged, but that's just, but prior to that, they had not reached out to you? I think it's fair to say that, yes, they, they have not been actively reaching out uh, until recently, yes. Yeah, and that's what I'm finding as well as I engage in my, in my region. And, and the reason I, I bring it up, um, because this is such an important issue. And so um, one of the areas that I'm focused on, um, and, and just for my colleagues, uh, in 2019, there was a report um, on the low income housing and community development activities of the federal home loan banks. There was only one reference to investment in tribes. Only the Des Moines uh, Bank offered a program, uh, a Native American Home Ownership Initiative. Um, and I know, and this is the reason I'm bringing it up, because we all feel the same way that we've got to do a better job here. So. Because of this, I recently introduced legislation, it's S-1684, it's the Federal Home Loan Bank's Mission Implementation Act, which would strengthen the ability of the banks to invest in communities. And the bill, uh, my bill includes a 2% set aside for tribes. And this is an area that we've got a great opportunity to focus on. And uh, I look forward to more conversations on this issue, but thank you for this great hearing. Thank you so much, Senator Cortez Masto. Now, I, there's Senator Lummis. Uh, I will, I'll next turn to Senator Lummis. Welcome. Well, thank you so much, Madam Chairman and, and uh, uh, Senator Rounds for holding this hearing. Um, I'm going to focus my questions on the um, economically dis disadvantaged uh, Native Americans uh, in my state. That includes um, a substantial number of the members of the uh, Eastern Shoshone and Northern Arapaho tribes in, in Wyoming on the Wind River Reservation. And, and also, as you know, Senator Rounds, the Oglala Lakota uh, at Pine Ridge. Um, and, and there's uh, 
there are issues that relate to housing that really do affect uh, their uh, financial and personal well-being. Um, and I want to start with some questions about how the census uh, may have um, inaccurately counted, because it's so difficult, uh, the number of uh, Native Americans and uh, how many are living in each household. You know, if you have uh, a Native American household where uh, there are multiple generations, there are extra workers, uh, they're trying to uh, uh, keep everybody housed, uh, perhaps in housing that is uh, smaller than uh, would normally be considered in the United States um, adequate for that many people, then uh, some the census comes along and maybe they're reluctant to discuss how many people are living in their household. So uh, question number one, and I think this is for uh, Mr. Uh, Desiderio and, and Ms. Uh, Chiramov. It, it is counting, is the census an issue and is it contributing to uh, undercounts? So I, I just want to categorically say yes to that question. Um, and just the, the, the idea that uh, tribal communities are consistently undercounted in the census is pretty significant for the amount of funding that goes out to tribes. The reluctance, uh, you know, for tribal uh, citizens to contribute to the census has always been an issue. And then this past um, census uh, is going to have a severe impact on that because of the pandemic and because of the idea that a lot of tribes are in rural and remote areas. And um, this information, you know, needs face to face and that hasn't been done as adequately in the last census. So, yes, this is, it's an important issue. Uh, the reluctance and the higher households, it's important that we get an accurate count and I'm not sure we're doing that at this point. Um, thank you. I, I would also, thank you, Senator. I would also offer, I, I would agree with what Mr. Desiderio has just said. I think Native Americans are at risk of being under or miscounted, I think, for two important reasons. First, um, the American Community Survey, which provides annually updated data about reservations and communities across the country, doesn't include information about tribal enrollment. And so it can make it difficult to understand how housing challenges might vary across tribes and renders the ATS less useful for program implementation than it could otherwise be. Um, and it means that the population measured in the census data is not actually directly comparable to population measured in a tribal census, for example. Um, the second challenge is, as Dante was just mentioning, that Native Americans are vulnerable to undercounting in the decennial census, um, and obviously by extension the ACS, and that's driven in part by you know, the higher likelihood of renting, lack of infrastructure, potentially phones, maybe uh, issues with trust in the federal government, access to broadband, things like that. So the U.S. Census Bureau estimates that the undercount in the 2010 census of American Indians and Alaska Natives was about 4.9 percent, which is substantially higher than Black Americans at 2.1 percent or Hispanic at 1.5 percent uh, comparing across different groups of people. So it's a very, I think, important question. Thank you. Um, and if you have some thoughts about concrete steps we can take to address this, I'd love to have you submit them in, in writing. And that's that's to any of our witnesses. Um, I have a question for Mr. Shepard. You know, data is showing that it calls to 911 around uh, the most economically disadvantaged Native American areas um, come from Native Americans that don't have reliable reliable housing. Um, so is it reasonable to assume that we can reduce some of the strain on our local public safety agencies by improving Native American housing? Of course, <clears throat> that takes me back to the reauthorization of the NAHASA also. We also want to recommend after, if the opportunity rises that NAHASA be authorized, such formal reauthorization is long to do. Um, and if this should happen, we continue to join with most with most other tribes, CDHEs and national and regional native housing associations to advocate that the reauthorization modify the existing NAHAS at 30% rental payment rule. If the country fails now to address the flight of Indian housing, it would be a disastrous to tribes and other Alaska native communities 
and to those hundreds of thousands of Native people and families who suffered so greatly with overcrowded and severely substandard housing. Yeah. Well, it sure was a big issue in Wyoming during COVID. Uh, and so uh, we learned a lot, all of us during COVID, about some of the uh, soft underbelly of our uh, supply chains, uh, about, and, and certainly on, on our reservations, um, housing was a big issue. Um, I, there was an incident, um, I'll, I'll tell you about it, on the Wind River Reservation, uh, where uh, an, an indigent Native American person uh, was um, exhibiting symptoms of COVID, uh, but he was uh, in a park in a city, uh, and they had to take him to the Indian Health Service in the back of a pickup because there were inadequate uh, medical service providers, uh, an ambulance that was uh, that was uh, subject to sterilization from from COVID. I we learned so much during COVID, and this is yes yet another area where we've got a lot of work to do. Um, so, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Ranking Member, and Madam Chairman, I want to thank you once again for holding this hearing, and thank you very much to our witnesses. I yield back. Thank you so much, Senator Lemus. Um, I think we have time for another round of questions. If Senator Rounds would like to ask anything more, I would like to, and anybody else who's here, and I, I know that Senator Tester and Senator Ossoff are trying to get back, but have conflicts with other committees. So let me just go to um, my question. And I wanna follow up on this USDA loan 502 a pilot program that Senator Rounds mentioned and I mentioned as well. And um, Aline, I'm going to direct this to you. you. I think you mentioned this in your testimony. Um, so the USDA's 502 direct loan program offers single family home loans to low income rural households, um, but only about 2.6% of these loans go to native families. And um, so we established, the USDA established this pilot program in North and South Dakota where native CDFIs could use their community-based networks to deploy these USDA mortgages. Aline, could you talk to us about sort of what we've learned from this, what impact? Um, I'm looking at ways that we could expand this pilot nationally and would love to hear your thoughts on, um, you know, what kind of where you think we should go from here with this. Well, thank you, Senator. I think I mentioned in my testimony as well that I think some of the federal loan programs that are designed to provide mortgage financing on trust lands um, or just in general, and then the difficulty of actually providing those loans on trust lands, I think are are present across multiple programs. And I think that the, that same case applies in the 502 program. I think the pilot relending program, I think provides a promising example of the way in which CDFIs can be leveraged to um, in community to serve more customers. And so in that example, you could see the relending increasing the overall, the total number of loans. Um, you know, I think it was 17 loans in one year versus 11, 11 loans in the prior 11 years. Um, and so it's really, you can see the power of the network. I think in that instance as well, the CDFIs provide financial education and other borrower support um, to, to make the program more, overall more successful. So I think there are promising examples there. I think, however, there are the kind of broader systemic issues that we had talked about earlier about issues relating to land, trust, the use of trust land, and then borrower um, uh, lender knowledge of lending on trust land that I think is, is another avenue outside of CDFIs that continues to be um, an, an area of opportunity to look for solutions. Thank you. Thanks so much. And let me just ask, uh, maybe I'll just direct this broadly to the panel. Um, as, you know, as I've listened to your testimony today, you've each raised a number of really you know, practical and clear uh, um, issues and ideas for where we can go from here. So let me just maybe ask each of you if there's anything more that you'd like to say, what is the single most important thing that we could do in your mind to um, addressing uh, this lack of access to affordable housing and good quality housing that is such a uh, such a deep uh, such a deep challenge so um, if, if I may start um, so th this is a really um, interesting question I think it gets to the idea that if the the housing situation is becoming um, worse in Indian country or more challenging, 
we need to change the way that we're doing things. So taking a holistic approach, so you have we, the incentives are not lined up to have the capital markets come in. Um, so I would love a question. I was tuned into the banking hearing yesterday for the CEOs of the banks. Uh, and the idea that um, the, uh, the Community Reinvestment Act was passed uh, last year and now it's on hold. But what are those banks doing to serve Indian country who are now squarely in their assessment area? What are their plans? And most of the large banks don't have plans on addressing Indian country. And they have no intention of doing that because it's more difficult. So we need to align the incentives of the capital markets to um, do business in Indian country. And I think the Community Reinvestment Act, the way that that has lined up, it gives Indian country as a distressed area uh, the, in, the incentive that banks need to come in. They get multiples that are applied to doing business in Indian country so they can meet their CRA qualifications sooner. Uh, they also have the ability to invest in the banks that have learned to deal with Indian country. And they also can do equity investments and support CDFIs. Um, and I think that those kind of incentives when you're lining it up and that kind of um, uh, structure is really what we need on the incentive side. The support from the federal government in dealing with this one house at a time for you know the USDA program is good to show banks the way. But when we're looking at this, the Title VI program shows the most promise because that program allows the tribe to leverage funds and develop um, housing developments instead of one house at a time. We should be supporting that and the other infrastructure that goes with it and really supplementing that program on the community development block grants that we're leveraging. With 95% guarantees, tribes are still having trouble getting banks to come in and support that. And that uh, it shows that it's not just the incentives. There has to be education on the banking side uh, who would love to have a 95% guarantee, but there's not always the education internally with the branches and the banks themselves to deal with Indian country. So okay. looking at where the incentives are, looking at the role of the government in doing developments and looking at bringing the capital markets in um, is really gonna be instrumental in solving this in a general way instead of the uh, you know look, looking at it one one house at a time. Right, thank you. My time is up. I'm going to turn back to Senator Rounds, but I appreciate that very much, and I look forward to following up on that conversation. I think it's very important. Senator Rounds, thank you, Madam Chair, and once again, thanks for holding this hearing. And and just so that our witnesses know, we've been called to a vote, and so we're probably going to. And it's up to the chairperson, but it looks like we've got about seven minutes left before the vote terminates on. So I'll be very brief. Uh, I want to thank all of our witnesses for being with us today. I do want to just touch base on the 184 uh, HUD loan program, the guarantee program. Um, it, it, we made some changes in this. Senator Smith and I have worked on this in the past. And more specifically, we partnered together on legislation called the Native American Housing Affordability Act. It was signed into law as a part of the December omnibus. Our legislation made it easier for 184 borrowers on tribal trust land to participate in the 184 program by allowing HUD to issue certificates of guarantee without waiting on the trailing documents from the BIA, provided that lenders indemnify HUD for defaults. Now, I'm hoping to get a better idea of how well these reforms have worked uh, in the six months since they've become a law. We may not have any evidence yet at all of, of success, but I was hoping that perhaps uh, there might have been some sort of an uptick in lending and. I just thought I would start uh, just very briefly. Mr. Stevens, do you know anything about whether or not there has been any uptick at all based on the changes made? Um, not yet, not that I've seen, but uh, for us in New York, we we were limited on the amount of uh, lending agencies that uh, offered the 184 program. At one point within the last year, we had nobody available to us. Uh, we just got recently, because we had applied recently, two, about three years ago, working with a company, then they were told that New York State refused to do 184. So okay. now we're back to that, and we do have a couple companies that we're working with right now to do 184 in, in New York State. So it's, it's, uh, it's a different issue, too, with the, the land issue that we have in New York State versus other 
other tribal areas too, so it's going to be a little tweaking that we have to do to really uh, make sure that we can get that uh, that program running up and running. And we are working with uh, one of the lending agencies now to do that. So. Okay, thank you very much, Miss uh, uh, Chermoff. I'm just curious uh, from at the Fed. There, have you heard anything? Have you seen anything with regard to that? The changes that we've made. Senator, we have we have not, and that's actually an area that we would love to work with with others on is just the availability of, of data on these programs so that we can you know continue to monitor and track um, progress of availability and where the loans are being used, for example. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. I know that we're pressed for time on this, so I'll yield back at this time. But I just want to say once again, thanks for holding this. Uh, I think. Uh, we can put together some good programs and I think this is something that all of us want to try to address and make improvements on. If it was easy, it would have been done a long time ago. Uh, there's lots of intricacies on it. There's lots of issues with regard to tribal trust. Uh, the, the, the challenges that we face just in terms of the amount of poverty that we find to begin with. But uh, this is something that I think this is an area that truly can make a difference for individuals that really could use some help. So, Madam Chair, thanks and I will yield back. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Rounds, and um, thank you so much to all of our witnesses for being a part of this uh, committee hearing, subcommittee hearing today, and for providing your testimony. Um, I want to just note that both Senator Rounds and I serve also on the um, Senate Indian Affairs Committee, and so we have an opportunity to work on these issues in both places here, and I know we've been listening hard around issues around reauthorizing the HASDA, um, as well as the other very great and specific ideas that you all have offered today. Uh, for senators who would wish to submit questions for the record, those questions are due one week from today, which will be Thursday, June 3rd. And for all of our witnesses, you have 45 days to respond any questions for the record.